Roy, Samuel, welcome to the Development by David podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, David. How are you doing? I am great. I've been really looking forward to this conversation because I heard it for the fir- I heard your story for the first time on mutual friend Aaron Lee's kickoff sessions, and uh, I then instantly was compelled to check you out on the BBC uh, listen, which was million is it million by thirty? Yeah, exactly, million by thirty. By 30. Yeah. And I, I heard your journey there, and it rang true to some of the observations I've made, and rang true to some of my story. And I knew I just had to reach out instantly to, to invite you on. So I really appreciate your time up front. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on. And uh, already in the three minutes that we've been speaking before we started recording, I've got uh, so much that I want to talk to you about. And I think a lot that we resonate on. So I'm excited to chat. Before we do that, mate, can we intrude up Development by David Still? If I were to ask you who's Roy Samuel today in 2023, how would you answer that or how would you show up to this podcast? I first off want to say I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question with, uh, with a comment, uh, an observation. I love that question because you frame it about where we are right now. Where are you in 2023? Because I think with the type of people that you have on the podcast, everyone's constantly reinventing themselves. You know, at a different moment in time, people are totally different people. So I think asking that question of where we are right now is a, is a great way of putting it. So right now, I'm the CEO and founder of, of Connected, which is a technology company. Uh, I'm an angel investor and I'm an advocate for neurodiversity, uh, suffering from severe ADHD and dyslexia myself. Uh, previously been a stand-up comedian, as you know, um, been a founder who's exited businesses previously uh, and just, you know, all around trying to stay out of trouble. I'm going to ask a really deep question off the bat now because I, I fall into the social normity that you just did. I also added into my question there, how would you like to show up? And the first thing that you mentioned was your titles. If I were to ask you, is that how you like to show up in, in the public domain or in social settings? Would you say that is true? Or how would you like to be known? So I think in public domain and social settings, right, two very separate spheres. And I think that the human brain likes to categorize right? They, it wants to know, this is what I'm speaking with. It likes to put things in a box. And people get very confused when you don't have that immediate form. A lot of people are, are you know, uh, morphophiles, right? They need to have that form so they can say, right, I understand what this is. Socially, um, I guess, describe. it's a really, really good question. I think, uh, you know, a reflection of what people see in themselves, hopefully. But uh, in, in a professional domain, Absolutely, you know, founder, investor, and uh, neurodiversity advocate. If I were to ask you off the bat to define the term angel investor, because this podcast kind of is try, I try and make it as accessible as possible. That might be a very nuanced niche term. How would you describe it? So, an angel investor tends to be uh, an investor who's investing in a startup prior to institutional investment coming in. So, as a business grows, it might take funding from a venture capital firm, might take funding from a private equity firm, but before it's ready for institutional investment, it seeks in, it, its investment from individuals called angel investors. And there's actually um, two main schools of thought over how the term angel investor really came to be. Uh, what, one school of thought, and it's actually the school of thought that I really subscribe to here, is that angel investors are quite hands-off. You know, they're there, but they're not that present. You know, they're in the ether, but they're not really involved. Um, other people thought the name Angel Investor actually came from uh, giving people an amazing lifeline. You know, when the business is just absolutely there, you know, basically dying, needing cash to keep going, that's when an angel comes in. But I think that's too much of an egotistical uh, description <laughs> of an angel investor. I think it's more just someone who came, comes in and is hands off and helps them get to that stage when they're ready for institutional cash to grow. The reason I asked that following the question I did before was because I want to ask this very deep, intimate question thereafter. Because of the power that you harness for founders and just people that might have an idea, a pre-institutionalized investment, do people love you for who you are or what you can do? Does anyone love anyone for who they are or for what they can do? I would say 90% of marriages are born out of fear of dying alone, right? I think, <laughs> you know, I think uh, that's, a, that's a really deep question, but, it, but most people are expecting something 
from a relationship. Otherwise, they don't tend to enter into that relationship. You know, as, as people are adults, they, that's why we don't form loads of new friendships. Um, I think people are looking for things out of it, for sure. Um, you know, most founders, as, uh, as suave as they think they are, who might drop me a message saying, hey, it'd be great to get to know you. I know it's obviously because, you know, I've, I've invested in 20 plus companies. So, um, yeah, you, you can't be naive on that side. But I think where you have the opportunity to really differentiate yourself is actually how you engage with founders during that process. So, for example, if I'm not investing right now, my immediate reply will be, hey, look, I'm capped out right now. You know, I know there's a lot of, we talk about um, what founders get out of the relationship. There are lots of angel investors who want their ego stroked out of the relationship and they will entertain those conversations because they want to feel like they're in that power dynamic. Um, so I see, you know, that side of it the whole time. So I try and be as honest as possible about being capped out. And then also when I have invested in a company, um, you know, whether that be, so I invested in a French fintech called Carmen last year and whether that's for them trying to make loads of, of introductions or help bring customers that their way i invested in a mental health company a few years ago and that was you know the, the the value i could bring there was actually more just um being a sounding board for the founder on the emotional side and the softer side of that relationship and nothing to do with introductions so that's where you can try and differentiate yourself uh but yeah totally you know founders are just trying to be mates for the sake of being mates that's for sure it's quite ironic that I asked that question when even this relationship's transactional. I knew you had a compelling story and I wanted to meet you and bring that on the podcast. I can't just sit here and pretend, no, I just want to be friends with Roy. Of course, this is transactional as well. Yeah, well, this is it. But I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, I, th I don't think we should be sitting here pretending to be entirely selfless human beings who are only doing things out of their, you know, intrinsic value of them. Um, that's, that's how we operate, right? And especially for entrepreneurial. But I think it's, about being honest about actually our intentions and also how we treat each other during that transaction that makes the big difference 100 percent. i'm going to add another layer to that question do you love yourself for who you are or what you can do <laughs> um i think loving oneself is a ongoing process and not a destination you can arrive at because i think who we are is defined by what we do. And every time there's a challenging situation, every time we're faced with, whether it be, you know, an employee who makes a terrible mistake and how are we going to respond to that as a founder or a, a founder who burns all your money, you know, how we respond to situations that ultimately determines, you know, who we are. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people think, well, we aren't our actions. Um, and it's... And we're not necessarily defined by our actions, but that's what gives us the proof over who we are in situations, right? And it's one thing to think that you're going to respond in a certain way. It's another to actually respond that way. So I think the you know, process of self-acceptance, the process of getting to a stage where you can say, I love who I am, is going to be determined by the stack of proof that you've built about things that you've done in different situations. So you can say well, I'm feeling shit about myself right now, or I'm not confident, or I'm not capable. But actually, I can point to this. I can point to that. So I think it's the mix of the internal dialogue of, of how we speak about ourselves and how we perceive ourselves, but then building up that stack of proof to say, yeah, well, I'm good with how that person's acted. I love that. It makes me believe that self-esteem is one's reputation with oneself. Mm, that's a great way of putting it. So to dive back into your origin story, given that you've got half Scottish blood and half Hungarian blood, I'd love to just hear the genesis of it all. Can we take it it's back? An ex it's an exotic mix, right? You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of really, really sexy, exotic melding of cultures and nations. I'm not sure how high up Hungarian and Scottish is on that list, but we'll, we'll take it. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, you, you, you were talking uh, to me before, just we start, before we started recording about the, um, you know, there are so many challenges beyond what is perceived when you come from either a working class background or where your family have come from a working class background. And I don't know how you found this. You went to, through KPMG and you went through that side of things. There are so many things that, were normal to me growing up, 
because of how my parents saw things or like a total lack of understanding about like food and health. And because my parents grew up in a situation where it's like, okay, we have food, great. You know, then the consideration of like what health is, like eating well, how to eat, like what is normal <laughs> to eat, like all these things, which are just these, these small um, uh, interactions we have with other people where it's like, no, no, no. Like, this is not a learned, like, th I did not know that that's what I should be doing in this situation. And there are all these small victories you have along the way, um, on even on a day-by-day -day basis, where it's like, uh, if people knew what I'd have naturally done in that situation, right? I want to share a quick anecdote with you, I think, make, make you laugh. The other day at KPMG, I was surrounded by the new graduates. Um... And they come from a very different background and had different privileges growing up. And they were talking about where they lived and some of the people that would chap on their doors on a day-to-day -day basis. So one had a fishmonger that came around every week and chapped the door for fresh fish. The other had an artist that came around chapping the door with new art. But for me or for perhaps you, the only person that came around my house was like a guy that had a carrier bag of stolen perfume or something like that. It just, it just really highlighted the difference on like what was normal when, when we grow up. And that was one of the, one of the examples that first came to mind when you brought up that, that sentiment, mate. Yeah, a hundred percent. For us, it was a guy who was selling, sto uh, selling stolen sponges. He'd be able to come around, you could buy like a, a sponge for a quid and it was literally <laughs> still out of the packet from pound world. Um, a hundred percent, hundred percent. And look, you know, t to be fair, um, to be totally transparent, because I don't want to misrepresent exactly, you know, where I came from by any means. Um, so my, my dad, East End of Glasgow, they, they grew up with a bit of money, lost everything when he was like three, four years old. Um, he ended up as a bus driver, he was a long distance truck driver, or lorry driver. Um, and then, you know, you know what it's like in Glasgow, he, he made his first bit of money as a owning a private cab company in the East End of Glasgow in the mid 70s, operating out of areas like Drum Chapel. And if you know anything about private cabs in Glasgow in the 70s and 80s, you know, what, what was necessarily going on there, you know, is, is I don't know how many cabs were being driven, but there was a, there was a lot going on um, and, and seeing that side of it. And then my mum, you know, grew up in abstract poverty in communist Hungary where they, you know, tried to escape the country multiple times. They came back and um, there were people living in their house they were, and they were displaced for a long period of time, you know, so it's, it's that to, you know, North London in the 90s um, is so different. So all, although I grew up, sometimes we had money, sometimes we didn't because my dad was an entrepreneur. He, you know, when I was like five, six years old, we were in a good place. Then he lost everything, literally started again from scratch when I was nine, 10. My mum was ill at that time. So for that two, three year period, we had no money. Um, and then there was some money and there wasn't money. So, you know, there, it was a bit of a, a mixed time. And some year we had, you know, when you're a very young kid, you, you recognize it as, you know, oh, this year, um, you know, me and my brother are living in a shared bedroom. Last year I had my own bedroom, you know, and th things like that. So th that's the way that you, you recognize it. But, you know, we, thankfully, we were never hungry. You know, we, we, it, was ne it was never like that. Uh, but we saw the ups and downs. You know, we saw the ups and downs of that side. Um, so growing up, I was very, very used to seeing the boom and bust of being an entrepreneur and what that meant in terms of sometimes you'll have, sometimes you won't. And there are periods when you're building where actually interaction with your family isn't necessarily a thing. You know, my dad was absent for a very long period of time as, as a result of trying to get things off the ground. Um, and sometimes things will be good, uh, but you never know what's around the corner. And I think that's actually been something which has been super helpful in riding the waves of entrepreneurialism and the highs and lows, because you never get too high, never get too low, because the next... The next twist is just around the corner, right? I was about to ask how that did manifest itself and you answered that beautifully. Why did you re <laughs> re relocate to North London? What, what, was, um, what, what was sold to you or your family down there that wasn't up here? So, so my mum, it's funny, I always say to her, so she, she, when they did escape from his Hungary, they ended up in, in Glasgow in the 80s. And I was like, I don't know what was worse. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Out the frying pan and into the fire, as I tell her constantly. Uh, I'm not sure where she would have been better off. Um, and then they, they moved down to Kent. They moved down to Kent in the late 80s. And then um, they were living in a very small place. My parents got married down there. 
Um, their their honeymoon was takeaway at a Chinese restaurant. You know, literally had nothing at that time. But that was the big thing um, for them. And they were they were telling me that story now. And then as my dad at that point, my dad was I think a door to door insurance salesman. Um, you know, just I think he had to get out of Glasgow. Basically, they moved down for various reasons. They moved down. He was doing door-to-door insurance stuff. And then he ended up uh, as se- selling te- telecommunications um, software from a big company called Colt, which is now owned by Fidelity, and that moved into London. Wow. So how, how old were you when you moved between Scotland and uh, England? Can I ask? Oh, I was, I was born in London. So I was you were born, born in, in London, okay. My, yeah, okay, exactly. So sense. I was born in 91. So they, they moved uh, from Kent to North London, like late 80s. Given that your dad had a business that once failed and then you rebounded back into money and stability, do you think if you never witnessed or experienced or your parents never experienced that rebound, that your appetite for entrepreneurialism would have been different? The fact that you could see the upside of or the, the, the possibilities on, of entrepreneurialism, do you think that's what propelled and empowered you, I don't want to use that wanky term empowered, but empowered you to believe and go off and do that. Whereas if it failed, then perhaps you might have not had the same risk appetite. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. To be honest, it's something I always wonder myself as well. I think uh, it certainly gave me my drive. You know, there are moments in time when my mum was ill and, you know, we didn't have much and it was like, well, I don't want, I never want that situation. So it always gave me drive. But that looked like, for example, um, you know, always trying to make money my own way, doing whatever it was. So I always had that drive. Um, but for a long time, and really until I was at uni, um, I thought I was ne- I never wanted to do the entrepreneurial thing because I didn't want to have nothing. I didn't want to have nothing. I knew what that was like. I didn't want that. So I was like, I'm going to be a management consultant. That's what I thought at uni. I was like, yeah, yeah, or maybe before, you know, I was like, yeah, I would like do my A-levels. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a management consultant. I want that stability. Um, and then you realize if you're not wired like that, if you can you can pretend all you want. But if you, you know, if, if you're going to seek this high and low, you're not going to necessarily get that stability. So then when I was at uni, founded my first company. Um, but, you know, it was running events, doing all sorts of things. And then, and then yeah, just led to student sock, which did fail. Um, but then we applied all, all the, the learnings from that into real sport. Are you first generation university? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, my my mom did. A, she went to. She got a teaching co- um, qualification, so she was a primary school teacher. So I think that might count. I don't know. I don't know if that does count. I don't want to offend anyone who might be doing the, you know, the teaching qualification if that's not uni. Um, but, but yeah, otherwise, yes. Uh, my dad dropped out of school at, or or I think he was kicked out of school at 16. Did you have the belief that university was for someone like you and, and, or did you use education as a lever to improve your own social mobility? It's a, it's an amazing question. And I always go back and forth on this. Do you know, have you come across Simon Squibb? He's, yes, um, he's the TikTok guy. TikTok, think, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so, so he's a good friend. We do a lot of stuff together. And I, I'm, we were talking about we did a podcast like last week, and he's someone who's so against the education system because it failed him, and he was homeless at 15. He's got an amazing story. Sold a massive company to PwC at like the age of 32. Like he's just got an awesome story, um, and he he felt like he was super failed by the education system, and actually for me like. The education system didn't edu- – yeah, getting A-levels, getting a degree has done nothing for me. You know, it's done nothing for me at all. However, meeting people in those situations and the social element of it and, for example, like having exposure to all the things that other people in society do who maybe are – and it's a shame to say it was just the reality of the situation – I when I was when I ended up do, so I ended up doing a master's. I met like three of my biggest investors through LSE. You know, I met my COO at LSE. So there is another side to education that people don't talk about. Now I don't think it's right. It's not the value of the degree itself. I I 
followed what I was really interested in. So I studied politics at undergrad. I then did a, a master's in international conflict studies. I wanted to become a diplomat, realized I wasn't diplomatic, so I became a founder. Um, but, you know, and, and that was what I was there for. But the, what I got out of it was, was a bit of a network. I love that. What I take away from that insight as a lesson is, so yeah, when we, when we talk about social mobility, we often blame the system, the education system's failed us, um, the government's failed us, but there's a intersection between your working class background and personal development or personal responsibility. And it seems like you hadn't understood what results you wanted, what environment or table those results sat in, who sat at that table and used education as a way to get a seat at that table. And ultimately that's what paid off uh, later down the line. Would that be a correct observation? Even if it's post-rationalized? No, no, 100%. And you're right, it is post-rationalization of it, but 100% in that it gave me exposure to people I would have never have had exposure to. It gave me the ability to build relationships with people I would never have had a look in with at that stage in my life if I hadn't gone to university. Now that's not a good thing about the system, but it was a way of utilizing it to, to my benefit for sure. If someone's sitting much like you 10, 15 years before you and is feeling some of those early symptoms, do you have any advice on how they can improve their quality of life through their social connections? How, how would you make a start on that? I know it's quite a broad question. It's a, it's a, it's a really great question. I think it all starts with that internal monologue. It all starts with belief and the feeling that you do belong, right? It, because the reality is there are two sets of rules in life. There are the rules that society gives you and then there are the rules of the game. And if you follow the rules society gives you, you will only ever play within the framework society wants to give. But if you see how it actually works, and if you see the fabric of the program and what's possible, if you tap into those rules, then there's nothing stopping you. And, and that's the way that you need to see life is not based on the narratives, it's based on the capabilities. So that would be the, the biggest thing that I can say to someone when thinking about how do they get where they want to be. Roy Samuel is legit. I want to snip that last 30 seconds and put some like, motivational music over it. That was legit. I love that. I, love I really, that. really love that, mate. <laughs> But you know what I mean, right? And it's something you've seen as well. The thing is, you're how I see the people that you get on your podcast, and I'm like, this guy gets it. You, according to society's rules, have no right to have the people that you've had. But you understand that it's not about society's rules, it's about what's possible. And you've said, no, I am going to get these people, and I am going to do that and do what I should have no right in air, and I'm not sure anyone listening, no right to be able to do. Because you see, it's not about what they tell you can do, it's about what you can achieve. And not to shine the spotlight on me or this podcast, but I think that's such a really good um, representation of the podcast. I don't often share how, how, how I, the kind of logistics of the podcast, but it started off with just one mentor who was one micro entrepreneur from my hometown. And that scaled into people like Sir Tom Hunter, who we referenced before we started, um, but also people like Seth Godin. Like Seth Godin and I are millions of miles away. He should not know who David McIntosh is. And for every Seth Godin I get on, I get nine rejections from other people in his realm. Um, and I think that's important to share as well. Like the, the amount of failures I've had in terms of growing this podcast um, is, is I can't count them in two hands, you know. Um, and I think you can either have luck or create your own luck. Um, you just need to understand if you want, for example, a Seth Godin or you want a, a certain angel investor, but you're like four nodes away from it, understand what nodes you can utilize to get yourself there and create that relationship. Um, but I think, honestly, the, the, the last 30 seconds that you gave me uh, before that are, are honestly perhaps one of the most inspiring anecdotes that I've had in the podcast. <laughs> but, but you're 100% right, David, because that's it. It's understanding what levers can I pull to get where I want to be. And it might be really difficult and it might be a thousand levers that you need to pull, but they are there. You just need to plot it out. You just need to plot it out, but you can get anywhere you want to be. Now, obviously there are things that it would be unfair to, to miss out. I am fully, you know, physically capable. You know, I, I am not, I don't have any disability, physical disabilities. I, you know, am white. 
and that does make you know and that means if i wasn't there would be more levers i have to pull you know these these are things which i think are very very real and it's important to acknowledge them but if you and this is why with my podcast and i think with your podcast even more than mine it's all about see it to believe it so when people hear these stories and they can see right that guy could do that and like the, the guy I had last week and um, um, uh, I forgot his name and the Stephen Scottish Beattie. guy, Stephen Beatty. It's like, that's why those stories are so important because it's like, okay, it is doable. What levers did they pull? I can do this. So if you can see it, and that's why representation is important. I, I'm, listen, I'm not super woke guy. I'm not that sort but that's why representation is important because everyone should have the ability to be like, yeah, okay, cool. I see the path. I see what I can do to get there. 100%. One of the levers that you had to pull was um or, or overcome was your neurodiversity um when did you get diagnosed as uh, neurodiverse and, and and what were those conditions and how did that make you feel when you found that news yeah no it's a great question so um dyslexia when i was like six seven years old because it was very very clear from a very early age so, so that was useful um things like just not being able to, to read properly getting letters confused uh Weird stuff like not being able to write in a, in a straight line. Everything would write would tail off like that, weirdly, like every single line. I don't know. Um, so they knew that very quickly. Um, and that was really useful. But ADHD, not till I was 15. And that was when I was basically about to be expelled from school. And I was super frustrated because it was just, I knew I wasn't an idiot, but I couldn't get good results in anything. I couldn't concentrate. So I was just a distraction to everyone bit of a class clown I, I, and to be fair to the teachers i was pulling everyone down around me you know, they, they were right to want to exclude me there's no two ways about it i was bringing other people down um but then that led to that adhd diagnosis and to be fair to my school i've got to say it to them like they were very ahead of their time because this would be like 2005 2006 they were very ahead of their time in um looking at neurodiversity uh, probably in a way that, that most schools did five, six years after that. So supporting me with that diagnosis and then helping me through that. And that allowed me go, to go from uh, nearly being expelled and virtually being expelled to uh, scraping through GCSEs and then doing really well in A-levels and then, and then on to uni. So I am very grateful to my school um, for that. I've read and heard you speak candidly. It's a really, actually, it's a really admirable mindset that you have around your neurodiversity you seem to speak more about the superpowers that it gave you than the hindrances that came with it what are some of the superpowers that adhd uh, has given you yeah so i think as as, as you all know right it's um uh, unrelenting energy at times you know when you can find that thing to get really excited by and you can just channel the energy into that there's nothing like it it, it, it really is a superpower it, it's you know it's like it's like nature's cocaine or whatever right you can you can really really just go down that route which is incredible which is incredible um so i think that's that's absolutely super power with it and then on the dyslexia side as well it's it's seen seen patterns you know because you can't read you word recognize now it means and ironically for me uh with, with such a strange name it means when i see words i don't recognize like I, I my mind just doesn't work it's so annoying so sometimes if i have you know, a, a guest on a podcast, and I just, I can't read their name. I'm like, you need to break it down for me phonetically because I actually can't read it. It's really weird. Um, so it means you have to recognize patterns. So when it comes to looking at trends, looking at analytics, even looking at spreadsheets, I can see where things are happening, even without understanding the formula, just because you, you start to see in patterns. So there's, there's amazing superpowers. Um, and I think, you know, in life, you're, you're, you're dealt with the cards that you are. Uh, so you've got to try and see them as superpowers and you've got to see the good out of it because it's not going to change, you know? Oh, I love that advice. One of the things you touched upon there was names, specifically your own name. How did having well, a very unique and Hungarian name, how did that affect um, your ability to show up in the world as a kid and teen and student and, and, and therefore founder thereafter? Well, you just you get off to a bad start, don't you? I mean, day one of school, it's like, okay, this is a minefield to navigate. Like above everything else, it's you know the teacher's going to get your name fucking wrong. Okay, every every I've had it all. I've had they thought an I was an L. 
So first day of year two, I was rolling. You know, I was rolling for the next three years, right? You can imagine like, the amount of uh, interpretation there's been over my name. But it led to a point where it's like, you become very agreeable as a person because it's like, I'm not going to correct everyone. So you just accept it. Like, I've spent <laughs> years, I've spent friendships, I've had relationships under a different name than my own, you know? So you just, you get used to that side of it, but it, it does... And even now, like, I get it because with LinkedIn and, like, sometimes if someone recognizes me, they'll be like, oh, hey, uh, good to see you. And it's like they want to they wanna say it or they want to avoid the name. It's just like a, it's a bit of a, um, an awkward moment. So I guess, you know, you just get used to that. And I've never won a competition, right? And if people can avoid saying that name <laughs> and picking out that name randomly, I never get picked out randomly for anything, right? They're, they're avoiding that. Um, but I think... Yeah, definitely. Like, it just means that every single one of your conversations is framed with, like, an awkward moment, you know, which is a really strange way to go through life. It's like every first interaction has a little awkward moment. Um, but, but, yeah, it's a strange one. Similar to your neurodiversity, do you think there has been any superpowers to having an obscure name? Like, I'm guessing it makes you more memorable. Uh, yeah, it could definitely, it could definitely do that for sure. And then, so don't com- uh, don't commit it's... a crime, mate. Don't definitely don't commit a crime because there's only <laughs> one. Uh, did you see one of you in the country? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's literally one of me in the country, which is which is crazy. And um, I think I've spoken to people. It's funny. We should have like a strange name support group. But I've spoken to people <laughs> who who go the other way. Who it's like they're desperate to not stand out because. They're so used to that. They don't want to be noticed because they don't want to go through that that like awkward moment. Um, so I guess it goes two ways. But uh, for sure, I think it forces you to know that you know you're going to be a bit different. I think that's the upside. Or, or you know, again, if you play the cards you dealt, you know every interaction is going to be weird. Like you just, I guess it, it breaks that barrier a little bit. <laughs> Moving on to real sport. Reading into that organization that you founded, uh, hearing you speak about it on podcast was hugely inspiring, The especially the, 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 the amount of engagement it got and the amount of users it got. Can we speak about what Real Sport is, the genesis story of it, and where, where it ended up for you personally? Yeah, 100%. And um, thank you for, for saying that. It's very, very kind in terms of, of some of the good stuff around it. So I um, essentially started a business called Student Sock when I was in my last year of university, which was essentially... Um, giving students at different universities somewhere to create content. Um, We were giving them the ability to build blogs, build podcasts. We rolled out about eight or nine different universities across the UK and um, advertisers didn't care because they didn't care about the student market and students had no money to spend. So it ran out of money within about eight months Uh, and it was really fun, but it didn't do anything. Um, But took a lot of those principles and saw the big trend in like all this online content creation. This is back in 2012. Uh, where it's like, okay, we can see that media is moving in this new direction. What can we do to bring this into a market which advertisers do care about and and people will actually spend? So we took this this content creation toolkit, helping people create podcasts, videos, other types of content, um, and then gave them tools for social amplification. So sharing that through Facebook, through Twitter, through Twitch, whatever it might be, uh, and giving them a community to share everything with. And we got really, really fortunate because we applied it to the world of sports and gaming. Massive sports fan myself was a bit of a gaming fan at the time. And it was just when sports journalism was picking up in a big way on Twitter. So if you remember World Cup 2014, Germany, Brazil, and it was when Germany absolutely slaughtered Brazil. And it was the biggest moment that Twitter had ever had to that point. And it was like, uh, this was like a year and a bit after we launched and just when the product was getting ready. And it was like, right. This is the future of, of sports content creation. It's the social journalism, you know, that's what people were calling it at the time. Um, so we just rode that wave, and Twitch had just launched, which was a big company, which was acquired by Amazon for about 19 billion. So lots of people were utilizing our tools for creating content for these platforms as well. So we got really lucky with that, um, scaled it to about uh, eight and a half, nine million monthly active unique users, primarily in the UK, US, and Australia and then acquired by a gaming company called Gfinity in 2018. Wow. How did you monetize that level of engagement? Was it a subscription-based model or through like advertising so, so, on the platform? 
Yes, that's a great question. So we, we basically had three tiers. So we had a fan zone. So anyone could just come in, create content, share content. And that was a bit of a free for all, um, varying levels of quality and <laughs> um, uh, safety, let's say. Um, so that was non monetizable. Uh, we would elevate the the content creators who got the most engagement to the next tier. And that was like under the real sport banner. And that was just getting loads of traffic, you know, content videos, articles, and that was all just monetized through traditional advertising forms. So either, you know, banner adverts, native, native video or um, sponsored content as well. So we would do sponsored content, with Domino's pizza, Lucas aid links, wherever it be. And then we had a, a, a premium tier, which was behind the paywall. Um, and that we were creating loads of in-house exclusive content. So um, for me, one of the big things we did was, do you know uh, an MMA fighter called Michael Venom Page? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. He was very was, electric, wasn't he? A very electric, super viral guy. So we were literally managing all of his socials at the time. We did a documentary series with him called Can't Stand the Heat, which was taking him to um, local places where he used to eat growing up and then take him to like a, a Michelin star restaurant talking about like the other side of food as a, as a fighter. So all, all that sort of cool content was behind the paywall uh, and that was how we monetized it. Oh, that's awesome. When you kicked off Real Sport, was it instantly monetizable or was it just a community only and then you mo- like commoditized it and, and, and commercialized it or did you go in with this kind of monetizable mindset off the bat? No, I wish we had. I wish we had. That was one of my biggest, you know, mistakes and, and biggest learnings is uh, a free user does not behave like a paid user. And every free t- user test that you do does not accurately predict how paid users are going to utilize something. So I wish we had turned monetization on. I wish we had seen things through that lens from day one. Because what we found is a lot of the learnings from year one actually didn't apply to what we were doing in year two, year three. And obviously the product had iterated on that, but every you know, business that I've invested in, like it's just very, very clear free users and paid users behave differently. Um, so I wish we'd started monetizing earlier and we would have probably gone a lot further if we had. That's a note to the founders who are tuning into this podcast. Monetize instantly. <laughs> 100%. 100%. <laughs> Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to make a, an observation about the landscape. It seems like the, the kind of life cycle of social media has changed from connecting individuals or creating communities to just disseminating and pushing information. We seem less, social media seems less tailored or less by design to make us gel together and, and create relationships and friendships. It just seems like an absolute information machine gun. Do you think the principle of real support, the kind of community aspect of it, do you think that would be survivable today uh, in 2023? No, I don't. I don't at all because, and I think you're you know, so right with the point that you're making there. Um, social media has become w- what used to be about a very, very defensible, unique network. I use this platform because I've built up a network with these people who I engage with through this medium is now a content delivery system. And with the rise of automated content creation tools, these content delivery systems will no longer be social media platforms and they're not not defensible. And I think you're gonna see a total crisis within these platforms and a crisis of consciousness because we are not going to be sure whether the content we're consuming is authentic, if it's generated, is a human behind it, is AI behind it. Um, So from from my perspective now, when I'm looking at investing in companies, I'm only investing in platforms which are building unique networks by individuals because I believe in five to ten years' time, anything which is one-way traffic the way that Instagram is, the way that TikTok is now in many, many ways, there'll be no defensibility from AI. Uh, It's only things between real people that that there's going to be a moat around. Wow. See, in a very similar vein, something, one of the questions that come to mind, should individuals in that case focus on building a business or should they focus on building a personal brand? Because if they create a bit of personal brand, they have that accountability, defensibility before they can hinge products and businesses off of it. If there's a listener who wants to kickstart some sort of an entrepreneurial journey based on the reflection of social media, should they should they build a personal brand before they build a business or 
because I, I feel like back in the day in the like 90s 2000s people would build a business and then they would get merit for that and be recognized for that but now it seems like every influencer builds a personal brand and then spins off five different companies what's your kind of reflections on that question and i might be wrong but it's just again my observations i, I think you're 100 right i think you're 100 right um the amount of influencer-led brands is is incredible and i do believe that influencer-led funds we're seeing more of whether it be in the sports space you know the serena williams and the Mar- like lebron james there, there's so much influencer-led um commercial activity now so i think you're 100 percent right i think uh, it's depressing to say i think it's important to refine at an early stage what you're really good at and if that's being if that's building a personal brand do that you know do that if you are super interested in physics and can build you know uh domain expertise in a subject and that's your passion do that and collaboration is going to be really really key collaboration so if you're the physics person find the influencer to, to work with you on these things i think once you have got a certain level of credibility you're going to find building that personal brand a lot easier you know you're going to find that a lot easier after the fact but to be honest i see 18 year olds who are experts you know in every subject and they seem to have millions of followers so what do i know <laughs> you know they i mean it's it's it seems to be all bets are off um but i i think that where i think it becomes an issue is once everything is an avatar and I don't think we're far off from that. How do we know what is a totally automated influencer and what is what is real, right? And how do you dis- discern between them? So I think trying to build your edge on podcasting different, right? This is a very real format. You know, people know it's you. People can see that content. But just LinkedIn posts, like just doing a paragraph LinkedIn post, just doing something like that. It, I just don't see it having a future. I'm not ashamed to admit that I've been using chat GPT as well for um, this podcast. And that's just automated um, open source information being um, compiled by a bot. Um, oh, that's scary. That's so stark, really. Uh, really. But, okay. So, so imagine this, right? Imagine, imagine in three years time um, where, augmented reality or even vr has gotten to a stage from a graphics perspective where it looks really good state-of-the-art graphics it looks fantastic and then you're in a room with 10 avatars and you know you're an avatar yourself in this room as well and six of the people are real and four of them are utilizing a chat gpt type um you know language processor you don't know who's real or who's fake like there's no way that you can know that and if anything you're probably gonna have a better conversation with a person you you know with the chat gpt thing right and and with the state of the art graphics i don't know if you play fifa or look at fifa like you don't know the difference between a real football game on tv and when fifa's on so i think we get to a stage in five years time where it's no longer deniable it's no longer deniable that we are in a simulation now you can't prove it but it can't be denied because the level of, of technological capability is there. And I think you have a massive backlash to that where people want to understand what's real and what's not. And I think, um, and, that, and that's why I think of building businesses where it's about building connections between real verified human beings, I think will be a, a very, very important segment. I read into the effects AI have had on um, intimate relationships. So a lot of OnlyFans, uh, the kind of explicit kind of content, uh, it's not labelled as explicit content platform, but is pr- predominantly used uh, for that. People, the creators on that platform are using AI tools to connect with their subscribers, and people who are the subscribers are typically, I'm not to ca- not to generalise and categorise, but lonelier guys, and they're getting right. what feels like an intimate relationship with a model but it's completely funneled through AI. And I wonder how that's going to warp how they perceive real life intimate relationships with females or, 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 or males or anyone else. Um, oh, yeah. It really terrifies me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? Now, I, I think 
even now, like if you go on Tinder, how, how do you know that the person's not utilizing that? Like, how do you know this is not a mass scam? And I, this is what I mean. So right now we're just, we're scratching the surface, but you can see with the rate of technological innovation in five years time, actually, I don't know if this person experience feeling is real is going to be one of our fundamental day-to-day -day problems. <sighs> You've ruined my night, really. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what you're going to come back to, right? It actually doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter whether this is all simulated or not already. Because if you live your life where it's actually about your enjoyment, how you treat other people, how, what, how we can affect change by, by being good to others and enjoying ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis, then it actually doesn't matter. And that's the, that's the only way for me to think about it. I love that. I I'm going to hook on to something you said earlier about the refinement of personal brand. Given that you are an uh, angel investor, exited CEO, current CEO, and stand-up comedian, have you and a neurodiversity advocate? Have you been intentional on, intentional on how you're perceived in different domains? Because we spoke about how I now do stand-up comedy, which is worlds apart from my advocacy for social mobility within KPMG, which is also miles away from me as a podcast host. And I'm conflated at the moment on what avenue I double down on because I feel like I need to refine to one or the other. Um, unless, and if I continue to have this hybrid of all of these things, do I recognize myself? Or if I go down one avenue, will I still recognize myself? Have you had to manage that for yourself given the multiple domains in which you operate in? Yeah, it's, um, you know, you, David, you've got such a great way of putting things, I've got to say. Like, I'm, I'm really a fan of the way that you, you, know, you make things so succinct but, but profound as well. But um, it's, a re it's a really, really interesting one, right? It's, it's Carl Jung, right? The, the, the theory of the shadow. We all have these different versions of ourselves. And the idea is, right, integrate the shadow or the shadow will integrate you. And I think as, as, as people who have got these different, you know, um, elements to our personalities, to our ambitions, like sometimes it's, it's easier to go down the route of, you know, segmenting different things and saying this part doesn't touch that part. But I think one of the goals of life should be to live whole. And how can we try and integrate all of these things? Now, I think that's one of the goals of life. I've never managed it. You know, I've, I've never been able to do that. And I, the, pretty much the day we launched, uh, so the, the day, I think a week after we sold Real Sport, I started stand up. And because I was all in on Real Sport, but I was like, I want to do stand up. So I started stand up. And then two months after we launched the Connected MVP was the last time I did stand up. So that 20 month period, I was all in because I, I've never been able to figure out that, that how do you bring all of these parts together to make them whole? Um, but I am seeing now, and the first two years are connected, you know, look, I, I know it's now quite unfashionable to uh, gl glorify like the hustle culture, but first two, two and a half years are connected, 16 hours a day. I didn't have a life. I never, never, ever sacrificed sleep. I was always getting my six hours sleep a night. I'm not one of these people like three hours sleep. That's just unsustainable and insane. But every waking moment was, was connected. Um, and now, though, as we're into getting into year three of Connected, and, and thankfully like, the infrastructure has got to a certain size, and we've got you know sixty people globally, I am start. I am able again to try and become a bit more of a human being. But this is the first time I've been able to do that in a long time. And, and but that's what I think it's about. I think it's about trying to integrate all the parts together. To touch back on real sport, what are some of the personal highs that you got to experience because of? Uh, the nature of that business and how fast it accelerated. Oh, I mean, if you want uh, highs, being in the sports business, I mean, that is... If, are you a sports fan? Uh, yeah, hugely. Well, what are your sports? MMA and boxing and kind of football. I kind of I've fallen out of love of football, but MMA and boxing have my attention at the moment. Nice. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, you know, if you're a sports fan, right, getting to be in the thick of it in those things. And we... We had a big, we were really, really well connected in, in American sports. We had a couple NFL players on a cap table who had invested in us as uh, some really cool people. One of them won two Super Bowls with the Denver Broncos back in the 90s. Some really cool people who had invested in us. So we went to uh, um, the, uh, what is it? Uh, 
I think, yeah, I want to say the Condé Nast um, Super Bowl party for Super Bowl 50. Like, we had all these, like, being in the sports industry, that's where you want to be for, like, all these amazing experiences. So, so many highs on that side. Um, but then also, you know, lots of lows along the way, you know, all the usual sacrifice, all the usual things that you have to give up um, when you're when you're doing the entrepreneurial side. But, yeah, it was amazing. Got to go to every sport event I wanted to go to and, and you know, loved that side of it. It was so fun. How did you make the decision to exit real sport in that case? Because not only was it fundamentally what gave you financial stability and financial reward, but also gave you um, fulfillment because of all these experiences. I'm guessing you had to let go of that cape as well as the, 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 the business cape that you had to let go of. How did you manage that inner conflict? Because I can imagine if it was me, even despite of the, the exit amount that I would receive, I would be at an inner crossroads because of the other experiences that it gave me. Yeah, so one thing which David, I'm sure you'll, you'll resonate with, um, I didn't understand how to manage money personally. It was not something that I was raised with. So when the day we sold Real Sport, do you know what some of my, uh, my exit proceeds went to? Paying off payday loans. You know, I, I, was, I was in a situation where it was like, because I, I didn't really pay myself a real sport. I thought, probably wrongly, that like part of the being with the entrepreneurial thing was being on the breadline. So we were on like 27K when we saw, like, when we saw the guy. We had nothing. Like for the first year, me and my co-founder would sleep in the office regularly. Um, just because that those were the options. So when we sold the company, and, and I probably shouldn't have done this, I should have paid myself better, but I, I didn't, this is the thing of not having people in your close network who've been there, done that. You don't know these things. So I had personal, I had a payday debt, you know, I had personal debt when we sold the company. So it was like a, a massive swing. So the stress of going through that acquisition of like, could be self-made millionaire at 26 or, you know, still have my payday loans, you know, and it's, it's that sort of swing. And it's like, so my personal situation was a big part and the same with my co-founder you know, a big part of, of why we knew we wanted to take it to exit and and you know maybe if we paid ourselves properly we would have had more long-term view and, and you know hindsight's 2020 and everything else um but for me i i think for most angel investors it's about getting a return on 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 investment and I have always felt massive loyalty to my angel investors, to anyone who's ever given me money, to anyone who's ever believed in it. Like I felt a massive loyalty to them. So I wanted to be able to deliver good returns. Um, but also I was aware of, of how inexperienced I was and how much we had done wrong. So it was like, yeah, look, this is a really good outcome. Let, let's do this. All of our core team made money. You know, some of the best moments is, uh, you know, one of my guys made 175 grand and it's like amazing. You know, you've got to big deposit on his house and all these things. So we were able to do all these really cool things, able to make sure all of our investors were sorted. And I wanted to learn. So the CEO of Gfinity who acquired us was the ex-CEO of Manchester City. He was on the board of the UFC during the acquisition for the Petita brothers. A uh, guy called Gary Cook, he's an awesome guy. He's actually, an, you should get him on the podcast. So he was a working class guy from Manchester, moved over to the US, ended up as a director of Nike and was the uh, entrepreneur of Nike Jordan with Michael Jordan like he's an awesome guy so it was like That's yeah of course sick. I'm going to learn of course I'm going to learn from this guy and then and learn all that side of it so um, I was really excited by what this was going to do as an opportunity for me and for my learning and, and for a potential next step as well um, and you know with my investors I said to them great re-up on the next one and they were my earliest investors in, in Connected oh, unbelievable story what are, did you reward yourself after the, besides paying off your payday loans, did you reward yourself or have you reward your, rewarded yourself uh, from that exit, if I were to ask? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely did some stupid things, which you would Can you tell me about them? Um, I, 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 I definitely probably took too many holidays and they were a bit lavish at that. Definitely, definitely did that side of it. Um, but, you know, it did all the things that you would do when you finally have money at 26 when you've never had an education around it now at that point to be fair i was very very cognizant of like right be as smart as you can um and the thing is it's funny once you get the exit like there's a lot of people who then start giving you advice and, and then want to start you know being being uh, part of the advisory group but i you know i bought a couple of properties and then i put most of it into angel investment 
because I love risk. I've got, you know, the highest risk side of it. So I was like, right, let, let's get into that side of things and learn amazing things along the way. I think one of the key ones is, um, you know, investing in people. One of the companies that I invested quite heavily into didn't work out, but the founder, she was amazing, um, you know, visionary, incredible what she does. She's now my COO at Connected. Um, so, you know, that, that's one of the things is it, it's all about people. That's amazing. Like using your wealth or that exit to uplift other people from the scenarios in which they found themselves in, like recognizing their talent and giving them the resources that someone who might have been middle class or upper class been able to get just because of the nature of their background. You've like improved the social mobility journeys of the people that worked for you once at Real Sport, but also the people that you, you invest in. And I think that's hugely admirable. I, I've loved Thank to, you, to learn that from you. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and to be honest, I'll, you know, I, I, it would be uh, incorrect for me to say that that was always at the forefront of my mind. And, and I don't want to make, make anyone think that that's my, that I've, I've been as purpose driven as that. But it's amazing to be able to get to help people along the way. Did the exit allow you to also focus on stand up between the exit of Real Sport and the launch of the MVP of Connected? Did I give you a bit of cushioning to? To, to double down on yeah, I mean, well. it, it definitely, it definitely gave me the ability to say, well, what do I want to do, um, and what you know, what would I enjoy doing, and that's why with connected, I wanted to build something which was to do with the world of, of angel investment because I enjoyed that side of it so much. So it was like great. So stand up. Um, so I, I always thought I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'd love to do stand up, and then I saw, I saw Dave Chappelle, and I'm a massive fan of Dave Chappelle, right? The best, the best. And I saw him in October 2017, so just before we sold Real Sport. And then I saw him a month after, so from April 2018, just after we sold it. And the first time I saw him, he killed. It was amazing. Like Jimmy Carr opened for him, he had John Stewart on tour, it was just unbelievable. And the second time I saw him, he had a bit of an off day. He had a bit of an off day where it was like most the same material, and it was like, Okay, he had because it was the same tour, I guess, or the same hour that he was touring, and he made a few tweaks, and like some of them worked, some of them didn't, and I was like, oh, hold on, like that's how you do it. Like you try stuff and then you tweak it, and then what gets funny, and then it's like that. I was like, I could do this, and then I was like, how dare you? How dare you think you can do what Dave Chappelle does? Like, you <laughs> arrogant little bastard! You know, how dare you? So my girlfriend at the time was like, go on then. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, yeah, cool. Put my money where my mouth is. Two days after that, did my first open mic. And I'd never seen open mic comedy. And you know what it's like. It's very different to doing to, to seeing arena tours, right? So that was a very <laughs> rude awakening. Um, and then it's like, it's so funny because, you know, in your first show, you're, you're grasping onto anything. It's like, I got two laughs in five minutes. And you're like, amazing, amazing. That's great. Like, I've got something here. I've got something here. And then by like the third show, it's like, oh, hold on. I'm, I need five minutes of laughs. Like that was, and it's, what you considered to be a really good response in your first five shows. And then actually what you realize is a really good response after like 50 shows. So it's like, it's a really fun learning experience. Like it's, it's, it's a, such a fulfilling journey. And I think everyone should try it. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think everyone should try it. I think everyone should have a, a death on stage. And for those who aren't ca- like comedy fans, a death on stage is where no one laughs and you can hear like the, the kind of buzzing sound of the kegs and the bar um yeah I think so have you had that, that have you bombed yes i have bombed okay. incredibly talk, talk um, me through because it... i i that, there's no better feeling than as someone who's bombed where it's like validate like i need to know that you felt as bad as i felt in that moments so that we're in this together so when i've been on first dates in my life or been on like dating apps people have asked me david what's the most embarrassing or most awkward thing that's ever happened to you and i've never really had one until i had my first death on stage and i'll tell you i'll give you some context right so my set my five minute set <laughs> is around losing my mum. It's making light of that hard time. Um, I'm very kind of dismissive of it. It's kind of very tongue in cheek. And I played at a bar called Tenants Bar and it was after the Rangers game had been on. So there was loads of Rangers fans had been out, um, part like drinking, celebrating the win. So they kind of straggled into the bar and it was very unsolicited comedy for them. They were just already in the bar. Um, and five minutes before my gig, my two cousins from my mum's side messaged me to say that they were going to surprise me at that gig and they sat at the front row and they were also at the football extremely drunk and I had to do five minutes dismissing my dead mum even though it's my way to grieve and the way, the way I've processed it, I had to do that right in front of them and I struck like, each word struggled to leave my throat 
And I got to a point where I was at no return and said, that's all I've got tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and had to walk off stage and put my hand on my head. <laughs> oh, it was awful. Uh, so that, 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 that's how I've died. That was my first death. Yeah, brutal, brutal. I, Separating I heard, the family. Uh, com- yeah. <laughs> I heard a comedian describe what bombing feels like, and I was like, I've been waiting to hear a description like this for like four years because it was the most valid thing. He goes, have you ever told someone that you love them? Okay, have you ever been in that situation? You ever yep, told yep, someone yep. that you love them? Okay. So imagine telling someone that you love them and then being like, eh. and that being in front of a room full of people, <laughs> that feeling, that's the feeling of bombing. Like that is how bombing feels. It's literally bearing your heart and soul. I think I am interesting, funny, whatever as a person. And a room full of people telling you, no, you're not. You know, it is literally <laughs> that level of brutality and being torn down. <laughs> oh, but that one moment has made other, it's kind of like cold water therapy for me. Having that really intense emotional labor has made every interaction with other people, whether it's public speaking or approaching a girl at a bar or speaking to someone higher up than me in the hierarchy, it's made it way more manageable because it will never be as hard as <laughs> laughing about my dead mum to a room full of family members who did not find it funny. <laughs> I don't know if, if, yeah. if, if you can have experienced that, by the way. Like the, Has that affected your ability to pitch or, or, or speak to people um, thereafter? Because I can imagine... like. Uh, after you you, you learned stand up and you, you you've died on stage and you, you've spoke to many people in a room, that has transgressed into your ability to pitch for. I'm not sure if you have had to pitch for connected, but I'm sure you've been in, in tricky meetings. Has there been parallels between the two, the two roles? A hundred percent, David. And you know you draw the right parallels there. And and um, before when we were catching up just before the podcast, and you were saying how much. Uh, you know, stand up has taught you about podcasts. Um, it's it's totally the same with with pitching. It, it you're, you're totally right. I mean, one side, you know, there is nothing more terrifying than doing stand up when it goes badly. So, doing a speech, I gave a talk at the UK Investor Show last year. It's like, I, I'm not trying to make these people laugh. I don't care. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's so easy after trying to make people laugh. You just don't need, you just don't say anything offensive. And you'll get through a business proposal. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's so hard to get that wrong. So 100%, once you do stand up, any pitch is easy. So that, just for that alone is so worth it. But the other thing is, like developing material for stand up, it's literally just iteration. And it's the same with pitching a business. When you're pitching investors, I'm using the exact same skills that I use to work on material. I'm, I'm seeing what lands. I'm literally understanding like when to break the inflection points. And like, for example, and I was, I remember pitching um, a year and a half ago to a VC. And there's four of them in the room and it's like, okay, this is landing. And then they're eating out your palm. And it's like that feeling when you're standing where it's like, okay, like your vibe. And it, it's amazing how much you can use it where it's literally like, okay, I know this bit's going to kill. And you're so excited to give that <laughs> up. Works the same in pictures. Like it's, it's honestly, it's, it's the same. Oh, I'm laughing so much because I know that feeling from a stand-up point of view. You know when the punchline's coming and you can feel the tension in the room and yeah, yeah. and then they react the way you want and there's no greater exactly. feeling than that. It really feeds the ego. But to hear that in a, in a business pitch sense from one of, the, one of the entrepreneurs I admire so much, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> and it's one of them where it's like, you know if they like that, they're going to love this bit. And it's the same, right? It's literally the same. So it's like, so you, it's like you can go with that extra bit of confidence on the second one because you know they like that first bit. It's the same in a pitch. Like it's honestly the same in a pitch. And I think there's, but, but ultimately that's what stand-up is, right? It's reading a room, it's gauging, it's, you know, adapting to, to the energy and, and drawing them in and, 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 you know, raising or lowering the tempo accordingly. It's, it's the same thing because ultimately stand-up is just, you know, reading a room full of people, understanding what's working, understanding what's not, reading the energy, matching it, taking people on a journey. It's storytelling at the end of the day, right? It's storytelling. And I guess that's the same wherever you apply it. Pitching, building a brand, personal brand. It's, it's all storytelling, isn't it? Yeah, and podcasting too. Um, I think one thing that's uniquely identifiable about stand-up comedy that isn't um, applicable to like pitching or public speaking is that 
pitching and public speaking is quite um, binary. It's either like informational or e- educational or um, perhaps even an aspect of entertainment. Like if you don't land on one avenue, you might land on the other. If you don't land on that, you might land on the next. Whereas comedy, the the unit of measurement is laughs. It's so, it's so non-binary. It's either funny or it isn't. And the process mm-hmm. is to make the, if I were to understand the process, it was to, is to make one room unanimously feel one emotion at the same time. All different people with different insights and different worldviews feel the same feeling at the same time. And if you can unlock that, then you can master, I think, any other social dynamics. I think it's such a unique superpower that uh, you can get from stand-up. That's super interesting. Um, I was listening to one of your podcasts earlier with the the biohacking person. I can't remember their name, but and I think it's a well, fascinating it's- subject. And um, you know, been reading a lot about you know neuroscience, as I think everyone has over the last few months. And there seems to be a real rush of that content at the moment. But imagine if you could, because it's things like we understand how stress is caused. One of those things. Imagine if there's like a neuroscientific or a neurological way of understanding what makes people laugh. Because if you could look into that side of it and then, you know, derive a set off the back of that and be like, okay, what is the universal, um, you know, uh, a stimulus that creates laughter? It'd be so interesting to do like a neurological um, study around that side of it. You have unlocked something. I'm going to have to like trim this bit of the podcast because I think we're into something that is going to be our, our USP and stand up. So I'm going to not give away this secret because I'm going to look into that. Oh, that's brilliant. Until, oh, until that's someone brilliant. then plugs that into ChatGPT and then it just does you a, a 10 minute stand up set, right? Have you have you uh, asked ChatGPT that yet? I have. It's ChatGPT is not funny at all. I said, write me, okay. uh, write me t- 10 minutes of stand up. It did. And it was so unfunny. Um, and similarly, okay. I was telling my I was telling my flatmate about ChatGPT. I was saying that I use it for developing the show notes at times, and he came in and, uh, and sat in my room and watched over my shoulder. And he was kind of amazed by the process. And he's a single guy, and he's South African, so he's moved to Glasgow. And the first thing he said, Roy, and it was hilarious. He said, "Tell ChatGPT to write me a love poem about Glasgow." <laughs> And it did. It talked about the Clyde. It talked about the East End. It talked about the West End. And he said, "David, you need to copy and paste that. Send me that right now." And I think that's his uh, Tinder introduction. Uh, no way. That's so funny. That's so. So it begins. So it begins. Right. Uh, to, to go back to to, to your story, I, I know I've taken so much of your time. I don't want to keep you for too much too much longer. Do you mind if I just ask some more questions about connected? And because uh, I, I really love the kind of. What, from what I gather, the mission statement of it is to like democratize angel investing and, and investor landscape. Um, so yeah, l- I'd love to tell you. I'd love for you to tell the audience and the listeners all about Connected. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, where I started with Connected is as you as you said, you know, uh, democratizing networks. Um, you know, we're not all born with a network in that way, and realistically, when you're dealing with angel investors, particularly. Uh, there aren't well-trodden paths or routes to get to these people. It's not like institutional investors. We can go on their website and we could apply and do all these things. They're private individuals. And if you don't have them in the network, then it can be very, very difficult to get access to them. And that's something which Connect does really, really well. But as time went on, and actually very, very quickly, we realized that there's a whole other layer that requires democratization actually before network really makes an impact. And that's education more than anything. Because ultimately... Um, getting in front of the right person is one thing, but going to them in the right way is really, really key. And yeah. if you if you can speak to the right person, but you don't know how to speak their language, ultimately that conversation is not going to be as meaningful as when you have the tools to understand, well, how do I speak investor? You know, what are the right things to do? So we became very passionate, very driven, very quickly about saying, well, how do we arm as many people as possible with the tools that give them everything they could possibly need to have those conversations? And then, of course, bring people together on top of that. But we realized that the fundamental layer is giving everyone the knowledge of, well, what does it mean to raise? What do I need in place to raise? And then helping on that part. I love that. There's... A quote that I read from you, I think it's maybe in a Forbes article, where you say, and I might be paraphrasing, I might be butchering it, but uh, for any any first-time founder, the business is built on delusion. Do you try and curb that delusion with Connected, or do you still think 
that delusion is a superpower for a first time founder? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just a superpower, it's a necessity, right? Because with anything in life, the first time you do it, you don't have any experience. You know, the first time you do it, you're doing something brand new. So the delusion is, this is going to be a unicorn no matter what. And it's that the belief that you need to have to get there. The second time round, it's like, okay, well, I know everything that could go wrong and I'm getting better because we can navigate these things. But to get, you know, you've got to be up here for to be out there, right? So you need to have that delusion that says, I can go to a billion value. I've never done, I've never done this before. Of course, it's going to be worth a billion. That's deluded, right? It, it's deluded. But you've got to have that self-belief and that drive because especially as a first-time founder, if you want talented people to come work with you, if you want very smart, savvy people to invest in you, you need 100% confidence. Not arrogance, but 100% confidence. And you can only be confident the first time you do something if you're a bit deluded, right? Because you've got nothing to draw on. So I think that delusion is really important, but we're going to help you professionalize the delusion and make it a bit more, uh, a bit more accessible in that way. Oh, I love it. I've been thinking about imposter syndrome quite a lot. And I think if you're a maverick, which most entrepreneurs should aim to be, I believe, you should have imposter syndrome. And I hate reading about how debilitating it is on LinkedIn. I hate reading about how debilitating it is on Twitter. I think if you're a maverick or aim to be maverick in nature, you should have imposter syndrome because no one's trodden that path that you're, you've trodden on before. You are an imposter. In fact, if anything, every single human being is an imposter. We are a complex lattice of ideas and experiences, highlights and lowlights. We're all imposters of each other. And as soon as you realize that and realize that imposter syndrome is actually an imposter superpower, then I think that belief will allow you to propel to do great things uh, outside your periphery. 100%. I mean, what sort of psychopath actually believes they deserve what they've got, right? Everyone <laughs> should have imposter syndrome, you know? It's, it's, it's ludicrous to think otherwise. It, it, it really is because it, it's, if you're doing something brand new, of course you're an imposter. And you're always doing something brand new because the idea that it's happened before, therefore it will happen again, is just something we tell ourselves. You know, we're all doing something brand new. And of course we all feel like imposters because we are. We're not designed to live in this society. We're designed to wake up and hunt and eat and sleep and do all of these things. We're not designed for any of this. So obviously we're all feeling like, oh, this is unnatural. We're, we're walking around with social media. How unnatural could that be? It's one of the reasons why, um, you know, people who get uh, annoyed about pronouns and they're like, oh, that's, that's not natural. It's like, do you see what we, older, you're going on a tube to work where you're on the internet, nothing is natural. Get over it, right? Nothing is natural. So I think we're just all struggling with this, um, trying to find our identity, trying to find an understanding of how to navigate something which we have not evolved to do. Oh, that's another segment I need to chop up and put music over because that is, that is an Instagram motivational reel if I've ever heard one. How dare you give me this much caffeine at half, half seven? Really, honestly, that was... Uh, <laughs> <gasps> on that point though, I want to ask a question. Are you as equally delusional now that you're a second time founder? Or have you been mindful that you might be blindsided by the fact that you've been successful before? Yeah, I think um I think you are so much more aware of what could go wrong, you know, because you've seen things that go wrong. And I think you are that experience and delusion start to counterbalance. You know, and I think I think as the experience goes up, the delusion should, you know, go down because it's like, okay, well, actually now I know what I'm doing a bit more. Um, but yeah, you know, listen, I'm not in any way complaining. I'm super grateful for, you know, where I am right now, but I'm I'm very aware that I'm, I've got a good track record right now. You're one failure away from that track record changing, right? I'm 31, so I haven't had much time to fuck up yet. You know, it's, it's only downhill from here. No, obviously not. But, um, you know, you are very, very cognizant of like, okay, you want to maintain that track record and you want to work really, really hard not to lose it. Um, so I think the delusion goes down and you get much, much better at understanding your, your weaknesses, your blind spots and hiring accordingly. Um, my hiring this time around has been so much better because I'm like, okay, I know I can't do that. I know I need someone who's really good at this. Like bringing Claudia as my COO 
it was like, okay, I, I need this skill set here so that we can achieve something together because I'm good at what, what you might not be good at. Um, so I think you become much more cognizant of, of what could go wrong and how to try and account for that. Such sounds, sound insight and sound advice. My last question is going to be another deep one. Sorry to end it like this, Roy. Sorry to be so no, invasive. No, <laughs> what did you sacrifice in your 20s to have a million by 30? Um, everything I could. And this is where I think um, entrepreneurism can be an addiction. And I think that I am addicted to work. Um, so I sacrificed everything that I could sacrifice and that's not a good thing in order to get where I wanted to be and, and to, to have an exit at the age of 26. Um, but that meant I, you know, lost a six year relationship. I, you know, when you come out of university, that's when you've got the most mates, right? You're your uni mates, you're your home mates. You're your, I let, I finished real sport with three friends, you know, so there, there's a lot that you sacrifice along the way. And realistically with capitalism, we have a, a design something that will reward the more you put in too much is never enough right the more you put into being a founder the more you put into being all that there is social reward there is you know lots of dopamine along the way and lots of encouragement along the way so i sacrificed everything that i could don't think it was a good idea i don't think that is a healthy way of doing things but that is the reality of my experience of being a founder is if i could get rid of it to do what i was doing better i would but i don't I don't say that as a lesson to anyone, um, just a reality of my experience. Roy, this has been such a fun podcast, ladled with experience, ladled with humor, ladled with um, like really intimate, vulnerable uh, outlooks and uh, anecdotes. So I really appreciate you bringing such a high level of transparency, uh, but also humor to the podcast. I've really had so much fun. Um, I, I don't know if you want people to be directed to you in terms of social media. You have, or uh, what would you like to leave the audience with? Um, yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. I try and speak to as many people as possible. I love meeting people. So yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, but the last message to get to everyone, I'll, I'll end on a bit of a deep one, is um, assume it's not coming to you. You've got to go to it. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, David, you're a legend. Thank you so much.